I thought at first that being the last speaker would be bad and worse, but actually it, it's better to be the last speaker. And, and one of the reasons is I think I've heard the word adherence and from Charles compliance maybe a dozen or a couple of dozen times during the course of the day. And, and I think it really speaks to the problem that I'm going to talk about, and that is the problem that there's a great deal of, of uh, non-adherence uh, that's out there. And I think that I wish I'd brought my slide, which I didn't. Uh, basically, a saying, it's a, it's a saying that says, what you can measure, you can manage. And I think the problem is that we're not measuring what we need to measure, especially in clinical trials, but also in clinical care. I mentioned that in one of my earlier questions about how often we measure the patient's adherence or compliance during the course of a clinical trial. And the fact is, it's not often enough. And what we really need to do is to develop some new approaches to doing that. And for the past 20 years or so, I've been interested in this topic. And more recently, in the last uh, several years, while I was at the Gates Foundation, we began putting a lot of effort into measuring adherence, particularly in patients with uh, tuberculosis. But I think it carries over completely into uh, the work that uh, is, needs to be done, I think, in HIV. These are my disclosures. I did work. Somebody asked me about Proteus Health. I have consulted with Proteus. It's an interesting technology, which I'll say a little bit more about in a little while. Uh, but basically, what I want to do, and this will sound a little bit like a third grade lecture to some people, but I want to really spend a bit of time talking about adherence, what it is, and actually how we measure it. And most importantly, it's the definition below, and that is that non-adherence is present when the actual treatment a subject receives is different from the nominal or intended assignment. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, adherence is not a dichotomous variable, what I, but you hear people talk about that all the time, adherent versus non-adherent. But there's no single metric, either percent of prescribed doses or any other, that can adequately describe the actual patterns of adherence. I'm going to talk about patterns uh, quite a bit during the course of this presentation. And time is a very important component of describing adherence. And to do so, we really have to use a different common taxonomy for describing adherence. This is the taxonomy. It's called the ABC Project, uh, published back in 19, uh, 19, 2011. And it's the terminology that I'm going to use during the course of the presentation that I'm going to make. So in summary, medication adherence really is a process. And it's a process by which the patients take their medicine as prescribed. It starts out with initiation. And you'll see the little box below that says that 25% of patients do not initiate a prescription. And I'll show you some data on that in a minute. And there's lots of reasons why patients don't in initiate uh, their, their drugs. But I won't talk about those in detail. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a lot about implementation because We've really already talked a lot about implementation, particularly in terms of the development of drug resistance and implementation. And patterns of implementation or patterns of non-implementation are going to turn out to be very important. And then finally, there's persistence. And that is during the first year after therapy, for example, in HIV, 40% of patients have discontinued their treatment. Now, just a little bit of data on, on these three uh, uh, types or three components of adherence. In the United States, for example, and this comes from a very large database, 25% of patients do not initiate a new prescription. So this data comes from the US, and you can see that it varies from disease to disease, as one might expect. But in infectious disease, approximately 25% of patients don't initiate uh, their therapy. And when we look at other diseases, chronic diseases, that's also a problem with chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, uh, and hyperlipidemia. Implementation is a very important thing, again, for me to discuss. Daily, 15% of patients do not take their drugs as prescribed. And the little box below, uh, I'll try to interpret for you in a moment, that is that we have a dosing history uh, using electronic monitoring. And what we see by the vertical red lines are missed doses. And this is a, a history of, of dosing that was taken over two years. And basically, you can see that in this particular patient, he or she took 84% of their prescribed doses, which means they, met, they missed 16%. But as I'll show you in a moment, they don't miss them necessarily just randomly, as it appears on this uh, particular uh, box. They actually miss them often in very specific patterns. 
So for example, I'm showing you four different patterns of adherence in this implementation example. In each of these uh, boxes, the patient took 90 to 91 percent of their prescribed doses, but they were really quite different, and I think I'd be able to find the mouse here. You can see that in the panel A, this person was just simply slow to initiate, but then did a fairly good job of taking their medicines over a relatively long period of time. In panel B, we see a patient who did a relatively good job of taking their once-a-day medication on time, with a few exceptions, but then terminated their uh, adherence uh, before the end of the prescribed dosing interval. In C, we have a patient with what's called a drug holiday, where this patient was doing a nice, whoops, sorry. This patient was doing a good job taking their drug and then for a period of about a month missed all of their doses and then restarted on the medicine. And then there's an interesting pattern here which is worth mentioning and that's later on they began to have a more uh, variable pattern of adherence and times of adherence. And that can often be a clue that something is about to happen, that they may decide to discontinue the medicine again. And then on the fourth pattern here, we have a patient that does a very good job throughout the entire period of time with simply a few doses that might not have been taken at the correct time. So these patterns of adherence may turn out to be very important in terms of the development of resistance. And we found that in the work that we're doing in TB to be especially the case, that in tuberculosis, which is a curable disease, that patterns of adherence actually have quite an impact on the time or even the completeness of their response to the anti-tuberculosis medication. But finally, one of the most important problems that we have is persistence. And that overall, in HIV, 40% of patients with HIV in a clinical trial, and these are clinical trials, these are not treatment settings, they will discontinue their treatment by the end of 12 months. And you can see that that also varies by disease, so that in some cases, uh, like osteoporosis, uh, uh, persistence is, is pretty good, whereas in other diseases where we might not be surprised to see that in psychiatric diseases like depression, patients actually discontinue their treatment quite early after therapy. So it really depends on the patient's perception of the disease uh, and the uh, rigorousness of, of follow-up by those patients or to those patients. But it's very important, and I'll come back to this as I go on in my presentation, to talk about the importance of having data so that you can actually act on the data uh, and not look at data that's really valuable only in the retrospective uh, case. So the message is here that suboptimal adherence is the rule rather than the exception both in clinical trials, but also in treatment settings. The most important problem that we have, particularly in HIV, is lack of persistence. Poor implementation is problematic, but might be a, a precursor of discontinuation. And then again, percent adherence is insufficient to really characterize what's going on uh, in any individual patient. And what I'm going to talk about during a good portion of the remainder is that technologies are now available that are accurate detailed and high, re high resolution that we can use both in clinical care as well as in clinical trials. And I'm going to discuss several different technologies which can be used to improve adherence. But the main way that they improve adherence is actually, going back to the previous speaker, by letting the patient and the physician know what's happening, what they're doing, what the patient is doing with their medication and with their medication regimens. So I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about the adherence measurement methods, and those are summarized in this slide. And you can see that there are four quadrants uh, with different axes on the two quadrants. We have sparse sampling, we have methods that are biased, and we have reliable methods where we get rich sampling. And as you'll see uh, as I discuss this, I think that these kinds of, uh, of uh, technologies are really the most helpful for us to really understand what a patient is doing and then how to counsel that patient. We also heard the word counseling quite often during the course of the discussions earlier today. And I think that we need to understand that what we need to do counseling requires us to have that information about the patient. It requires individually tailored consultation or adherence interventions rather than uh, basically textbook uh, uh, implementation of, of adherence interventions. So I'm going to focus mainly on these technologies here uh, because those are the ones that are most effective in terms of giving us the kinds of dosing histories that I just uh, showed you. This little dot here is meant to represent the ingestible sensor. Uh, these other technologies are basically what are called pill-in-hand technologies, which basically simply show that the patient has opened up 
a bottle of pills or they've expressed something through a, a blister pack, but that it's possible to record the time of, of that uh, action as an event. It represents what's called pill in hand. And I think when I discuss this with a lot of individuals, most people are concerned, well, it really, has the patient actually swallowed the pill or is it just pill in hand? And there are data that really demonstrate that in more than 95% of case, uh, cases, if the patient holds the pill in their fingers or in their hand, they're gonna take that pill. Yes, you can not take the pill. There might be a small fraction of individuals who would, for some reason or other, prefer not to take the pills but still use the device. But those are really in the small minority and the vast majority of patients that we're using these technologies for uh, will in fact take the pill once they've got it in their hand. And, I, and I, I really do want to emphasize again that we really have to evaluate these methods on a lot of different uh, uh, ideas or a lot of different uh, components. That is acceptability not to the patient only, but to the provider and to the healthcare system. And we have to look at these really not so much from are they working, do we get good data from a particular uh, type of, of technology, but is that technology going to be implementable in a wide variety of, of situations, both in the developed world as in the developing world as well. And so you can sort of express that on a, on a different kind of, of, of scale. Uh, again, here it's, uh, uh, the x-axis here represents more resource intensive, harder to implement. The uh, vertical y-axis represents less objective versus more objective information that we got, get from these technologies. And basically the ones in the pink here represent the ones I'm gonna talk about a little bit more uh, that have the combination that we really would like to see is objective data, not so difficult to implement, and giving us good detailed data. All of these uh, methodologies that I'm showing in this slide are intended to give fairly detailed information about dosing history, but some such as self-report or supply monitoring or pill counts don't give us the kind of resolution that we really need to have if we want to be able to counsel a particular patient. So I'm going to go through fairly quickly uh, a detailed review of some of the adherence monitoring technologies. I won't go through all the details because I know that these will be put on the uh, web after the presentation, but I want to go through a, a, quite a number of interventions that are now in development or actually being implemented. And again, the most common one now is what I would call the electronic observation of therapy. And this just shows a bunch of the technologies that are being used for electronic observation of therapy. And what that means is that basically when the patient removes a pill from a container or from a blister pack, it's recorded as an event. That event can then be transmitted either directly electronically to a database, or in some cases the patient will come back with that device and have it downloaded uh, in their uh, uh, physician's office. But basically, there's a number of technologies. They vary a bit in terms of the uh, uh, ease of use and, and, and mainly in terms of cost, but basically these are the what are called the electronic observation of therapy. The most common one that many of you may have been involved with and used in the past is basically the MEMS device, and you've seen many publications probably that come from the MEMS. Uh, this is the wise pill uh, device, which has been used actually in a lot of HIV clinical studies as well as in clinical care. But other devices are really also becoming more widely available and, and less expensive. And the bottom of this slide just in, indicates a number of the companies that are currently involved in this sort of technology of, of electronic observation of therapy. Now here's the sort of pluses and minuses of, of uh, the electronic dose monitors. And again, I won't go through each of these in detail, but there are a large variety of dose monitors that are available. Uh, one of the problems is that they have been fairly expensive so that it hasn't been quite as easy to get them to be used in, in routine clinical care. Although I think in the, stand, uh, in the uh, setting of clinical trials, I think, again, one should use something, whatever is your favorite choice, but you really should be monitoring all clinical trials, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, again, these are relatively simple to use. They really uh, only uh, require the patient to open the cap of the, of the device in the, for the most part, and again, that information is transmitted either in real time or in pseudo real time to the provider. We've been working with a, uh, a device called the Medication Event Reminder Monitor, or, or MERM for short. We've been using this now 
for the past uh, couple of years in, in China and in India, primarily in the management of patients with tuberculosis. And the reason for that is that the way it's been designed is so that this box, which has a number of features on the front of the box to remind the patient that they should or be taking their medication, is just the right size for tuberculosis blister packs. And in most parts of the world, tuberculosis is treated using blister packs rather than uh, loose fill uh, pills. And so this container actually, uh, again, will hold uh, for drug-sensitive TB. It can hold the entire six months of treatment for drug-sensitive for patients with uh, MDR TB. It can hold a month's supply of those medicines. And again, one gets detailed dosing histories uh, from this. And I'm bringing this up in particular because if you look to the left at some of the features of this particular uh, container, this electronic monitor, uh, it can be mass produced. It can have a lot of patient instructions that are actually included on the box itself. It's powered by standard batteries. You can basically reuse the module, the electronic module of this box a number of times. And what that does fundamentally is substantially reduce the cost of this device and the cost of monitoring. In India, uh, we anticipate, for example, that in fact this device would cost about 10 additional dollars for a six months of therapy, and primarily because the monitor itself and even the box, depending on the construction of the box, can be reused. So for six months of therapy, actually you can get then uh, full six months of, of dosing histories on that uh, particular patient. So this device is actually now in uh, mass production uh, for use in, in India uh, and now in other parts of, of the world, uh, basically because of its uh, simplicity. And primarily right now it's being used for tuberculosis, but in fact there's no reason it couldn't be used for essentially a large number of other diseases, particularly those that are supplied as, uh, as blisters. And I'm just showing you quickly here uh, the uh, fact that this is one of the kinds of, of displays that uh, can be provided through this uh, MERM device. And this is what's called the, uh, the, the provider dashboard. This is what the provider, the person in the clinic that's responsible for the management of this tuberculosis patient can see and essentially can then use that information uh, for counseling of a patient who is having uh, difficulty. Again, this is just some of the details of how this uh, uh, particular device and process uh, works. I want to call particular attention to this particular bullet right down here that says provider counsels the patient using this graphical presentation of the patient's dosing history. And then based on that dosing history algorithm, the provider can essentially uh, individualize that feedback that's being provided to the patient. And I think what we do have are data already uh, demonstrating that that particular ability to show the patient, his or her, and this is why I brought it up with you, because I think it would be very helpful if the patient actually saw what they were doing, because many patients come in and say, yes, I've been taking all my medications, but when you show them this kind of display, they realize, oh, gee, I've missed quite a few doses in the past week or the past month, and you can really help to uh, counsel that patient when both of you are looking at the same information. Uh, one of the important parts about this particular uh, situation, but I think it applies across the board, is that this is a patient-centric patient and history-driven uh, device. And what we think, one of the other reasons we think this uh, will ultimately prove to be cost-effective is this enables what we call differentiated care for the patient. That is, if a patient is doing well, you look at the data, for example, if you look at this particular graph here, this patient has been highly compliant. And all you need to do then is look at this data, give the patient, say, great job, keep going, do, do what you're doing. But if you have a patient who's really having problems, then those are the patients that we call people who need differentiated care. They need to see somebody who really has the ability the, to connect with that patient, maybe someone who's been trained in what's called motivational interviewing and really be able to impact the way that that patient is going to behave as, going forward. Now again, this uh, bottom here shows that in uh, India, even in 2017, there were 45,000 patients basically who had been rolled out in this technology. And the governments in both India and in China have really decided that this is the way to go, that uh, 
the old approach to tuberculosis, which was directly observed therapy, is too expensive, and in fact, it's not really being implemented as uh, it thought uh, it could be. So using this kind of device and counseling the patient, uh, particularly on the basis of what they've been doing, I think is the direction that we need to try to go. And just, just a quick summary, you'll see that when we look at the effect on adherence in an earlier trial that was done in China, uh, it improves adherence. And a current trial, a cluster randomized trial that's being done in India, not only is the effect on patient adherence being looked at, but the effect on uh, disease outcomes and essentially the cost effectiveness is being investigated, again, in a large trial that's uh, going on in China. China is not even waiting for the result of this trial. They've decided that this needs to be implemented. And I think one of the important points that applies to TB, uh, and since many of your patients are infected with TB as well as an HIV, the WHO just came out with a 2017 recommendation, essentially a recommendation, a requirement that all patients with tuberculosis need to be monitored to improve their outcomes. So the World Health Organization, now this hasn't been said, for example, for HIV, but for tuberculosis, drug sensitive, as well as uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, all of those patients need this type of monitoring, not necessarily this device, but something that will allow those individuals, or us as providers, to, uh, in, uh, to uh, talk to those patients and counsel those patients as needed. Now there's a bunch of other devices. Uh, some are more intended, I would say, for the developed world than for the developing world. I would want to go through quickly some of these uh, just to demonstrate the variety of devices that are available because I think the other thing that needs to be mentioned is that there's no one technology or one device that's going to work for everybody. Uh, I think, you know, we, Jonathan has mentioned, others have mentioned, some people just don't want to do anything like this and they don't want to see their results. So uh, it's important that the information gets to the provider in a timely fashion, but the type of device that a patient prefers is something that should be individualized uh, by the uh, program. Again, the glow pack is, is essentially a device uh, not unlike uh, any other uh, pill in hand device. It does have some uh, features as part of it that uh, help patient remind that patient to take, uh, take their dose. Uh, it has ways that the patient can take this device away from home because, of course, that's always one of the problems that patients are not necessarily in the same location. So they need the ability to move around and be able to take their medicines with them when they, uh, uh, when they move around. Uh, an interesting approach uh, has been uh, what's called video dot or video obser observation of therapy. And basically, uh, this is something that's actually of very much interest to the uh, World Health Organization because I think they're just used to the idea that somebody has to watch the patient take his or her medication. Now, instead of having to come to the clinic or go to the patient's house, uh, you can have some sort of video obser observation of their therapy. There's more than one variant of this. One of the challenges is that uh, some patients don't like having their face recognized, particularly in outside of, of uh, the developed world. And uh, so uh, there are other approaches that I'll come to in just a second, but basically you see the diagram, it's just exactly what you would expect. The patient actually has to hold a uh, phone uh, in front of their face while they're taking a, a medication. The devices that are being used uh, most commonly now will actually identify the pill by the shape of the pill as well. And so, and can identify whether the patient actually swallowed the pill. That's called uh, validated video observed therapy. Uh, and this has become, I think, a very interesting and potentially exciting uh, way of, of monitoring uh, therapy. The problem uh, is and, and that, as, as illustrated partly in this slide, uh, it requires a smartphone. Uh, standard uh, flip phones wouldn't work for this, although the phone doesn't have to be as smart as necessarily an Apple phone. But you need a phone that can actually take a picture and send the data. But of course then the problem is that uh, that can require a fairly large amount of data to be transferred from the site where this uh, picture or VODT is, is taking place to the site where the data is being captured. Uh, and again, has the same advantages in that uh, the, uh, it, this is basically being provided in real time to the clinician, 
so that uh, she or he can again uh, do the appropriate thing in terms of interventions with that uh, patient. But again, the concern in some cases is uh, whether or not a patient is actually willing to have his or her face transmitted to a central location. This is called a validated uh, VDOT, and again, it has uh, this capability of, of showing the patient's uh, face and recognizing that face without actually taking a picture. So as we've hear, we're hearing a lot about face recognition technologies, this is a, another adaptation of face recognition te technologies as well as perhaps pill recognition technology and technology to ensure that the patient has actually swallowed the dose. Now this can be done, the, the validated VOT can be done with a little less data collection than a face recognition and therefore it's potentially more easily transmitted from the site where the VO, VDOT is taking place. And again, it's accurate. It facilitates this patient-centric observation. It should be affordable and scalable when there's enough smartphones available to, to implement these technology. And again, it's not dependent on the drug, the format of the drug, as long as it's gonna be in the hand and in the mouth that this technology should, should work. And there's a lot of evidence that's being developed here in the United States about the value of, of this v validated VDOT. Uh, and there's still a lot of in, uh, research that needs to be done about the implementation of this particular technology in resource limited settings. Everybody gets excited about the ingestible sensor because the question I'm always asked is, is again, is the patient actually taking the drug or just opening the package? And the ingestible sensors, there's two technologies that are being used. One is the radio frequency, the other is, is the uh, Proteus ingestible sensor. And the Proteus device is about the size as you see here. It's a very, very small microchip that can either be placed on the outside of the, the, of the pill itself or even inside or on uh, uh, basically embedded in the pill. For the most part now, it's being placed on the outside. The challenge with that is that in order to get those data, one has to have a patch placed on the body to detect the signal that's uh, emitted by the, uh, by the sensor once, uh, the, once the sensor uh, gets into the stomach acid. And this, of course, then also has to be transmitted from this patch through some sort of technology, whether it's wireless technology, and then on to the provider to generate that dosing history, type of dosing history that I showed you earlier. So it works, and it works very well, and it's been tested in tuberculosis, it's being tested in, in HIV. Uh, the accuracy is very high. The kind of information that you get is, is also quite, uh, quite granular. Uh, and the challenge here are the patch, and the challenge are the expense of essentially placing this ec extra little uh, chip on a pill or outside the container, uh, uh, out on a capsule. And so this is where the limitation of this, and it's being used. Uh, it, this is one that has actually been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. It, it's being used uh, by one company, Otsuka, in a product called Abilify, probably a good indication. It's also being used in certain high-risk, high-cost diseases, such as transplantation, where the loss of, a, uh, of an organ due to non-adherence is the most common reason for needing to replace an organ, and the cost of a second organ transplant is extremely high. So that's an area where the cost of the device and the cost of knowing what a patient is doing is actually very, very valuable. And again, the challenge for the ingestible sensors, they haven't been tested outside the uh, developed world. Certainly the technology works, and again, the real issue here is, is economics. That is, is it really going to be cost effective to use this? And again, you can say it's cost effective if you have a disease where the cost of, of uh, failure of the, of the drug, such as transplantation, is extraordinarily high. And some of the things which uh, some of us who work with that device and, and companies, maybe there are ways of simplifying the device somewhat to reduce the need. The, the patch itself is probably not acceptable in many patients with, or maybe most patients with HIV who are trying to avoid the potential of having stigma by having to, to wear this patch. So this just summarizes what I've just said. The accuracy is quite high and it's uh, quite good. 
And again, the issue here is primarily cost and the fact that it really hasn't been explored in the developing world. There are some other interesting approaches which are worth mentioning primarily because I think they can be combined with other approaches and technologies that we already have are using. So for example, there's something called the pill pack which basically, when you look at it, which I think I show on the next slide, is basically a little a, a special package that contains all of the medications that a person is supposed to take at a given time. So for example, in this little illustration, this is a pill you're supposed to take at, or a bunch of pills you're supposed to take at seven o'clock on Monday morning. All of those pills are packaged within the same small packet and the patient will get, for example, from the pharmacy a whole roll of pills that might cover an entire month of therapy. And all the patient then has to do is, is essentially to take apart that pack, empty the pack, and take the medications. Now the nice thing is that, a couple of nice things that turned out to be quite interesting. This company apparently has just recently been bought by Amazon. So Amazon, as some of you know, are getting very interested in the pharmaceutical business, particularly the pharmaceutical distribution business. And so with the kind of backing of this kind of technology that would come from Amazon, the uh, expansion of this technology much, much wider uh, is likely to be quite high. Now this particular package, if it's to be economic, has to be done by a special machine that fills these packages. These are not going to be done by some pharmacy technician working in the pharmacy putting five pills in a package. It has to be all be automated. So the automation equipment is really critical to the uh, success of this technology. But again, with backing of, of a company like Amazon into that, that's really interested in essentially opening up the pharmaceutical distribution market, this could be something that we will actually see, uh, particularly at least in the developing world and uh, developed world quite early. Again, it's an ideal solution for high pill burden disease states, especially when a pers person is taking multiple different medications at the same time. Many of these devices, and they're similar devices that package uh, medicines, particularly for older patients who may have memory difficulties and difficulty in really taking a large number of medications, again, in, uh, at the same time or at nearly the same time. It's relatively affordable as long as you've got the automation to fill those packages. Uh, and I think while the current challenge is no existing supply chain in, in place, certainly in resource limited settings, I would think again that Amazon's interest in this technology uh, will make it quite uh, useful and potentially affordable throughout the world. So to summarize really quickly, the electronic dose monitors, the pros and the cons, again, the pill in hand is acceptable, the differentiated care, it doesn't guarantee ingestion. Some of those electronic monitoring devices can be expensive. The video-based monitoring, I think, is actually quite promising. Uh, and again, it's uh, intensive labor if the picture actually has to be looked at, looked at by another human being to decide that this is the right patient. But if we get into the AI type of, of technology that would recognize the patient and do all that automatically without somebody at the other end actually looking at the, at the picture, uh, that may become quite uh, quite prevalent. Uh, again, the there, another ink-based innovation, which I didn't talk about, the AI intelligence for the uh, video dot, and then the ingestible sensors. You can see, again, each of these has their pros and cons. Uh, and really, I think, except for electronic dose monitoring uh, and, the, and, and the beginning now, the video-based monitoring, Essentially, all of these uh, other, techno other technologies are really limited for the moment uh, for use in the developed world and not in the developing world. And again, none has really been widely applied in the HIV field. I think that's uh, something that uh, I would certainly like to see happen because I think it would make a huge difference in terms of, of the kinds of problems that we were already talking about today. So just a couple of final uh, conclusion uh, spots, and I, I'll come back to one that I think I mentioned before, but I want to emphasize again. One is this improved linkage to care. That is, the decreased burden on the patient for having to come in for the tra traditional directly observed therapy, controlling treatments, and then encouraging patients, again, to enroll in public sector. This is a problem, as you may know, in India, where in initially, at least, a large fraction of the patients go to the private sector first. <clears throat> 
improved retention and care, and this is what I think is key, because it really uh, requires then, uh, not requires, but allows the provider to, to provide patient-centered, individualized responses to uh, what they see in, in the dosing history for that uh, patient. And we believe ultimately that's going to result in better health outcomes if the patient takes their medicine and takes it uh, as prescribed, both in HIV and, and TB, I think we will have better outcomes. And this is something that I mentioned briefly during one of my earlier questions, better development data. I think that what we really need to know when a drug is in development before it becomes available commercially to the, to the public, we need to know what kind of uh, forgiveness, and I know David Back had to leave, but uh, basically, how many doses can the patient miss? And then what pattern of doses are really going to lead us to having a patient who becomes resistant to a particular uh, therapy, whether it's tubercul anti-tuberculous therapy or HIV therapy? And we should know that before the drug actually gets onto the market. And if we have that information when the drug goes to the market and we're collecting that information on patients that are in clinical care, then I think we have a much better idea of which patients we need to spend the time with uh, and uh, work about work more on counseling those individual patients and just let the patients uh, who are doing good, well uh, not have to sit through. I know that uh, in most of the uh, developing world, patients who come in for medic medication refills are required to sit into a standard adherence counseling session, which I think in most cases is relatively unhelpful to most of those individuals. And what we really need is to know which of those individuals is having adherence problems and then send that patient to see somebody who's skilled in, uh, in uh, developing a relationship with that patient and perhaps using some of these more uh, specialized techniques like uh, motivational interviewing, which is not something that most of the providers would be able to do. So I think that's a very important component and one that probably is, is not adequately implemented I have a slide which I didn't bring along and didn't show uh, that really had to demonstrated the uh, poor compliance or poor adherence that occurs during the course of clinical trials. I did show you the, the uh, uh, fact that so many patients actually discontinue their therapy before uh, they uh, complete the course of therapy. So I want to just acknowledge the people that I've worked with over the years, uh, John Urquhart, uh, the late John Urquhart, Bernard Vrienz, the late Lou Shiner, Lars Osterberg, Carl Peck, and mostly Bruce Thomas, the person I've been working with for the past three and a half years uh, at the Gates Foundation for the work that I'm describing on the anti-tuberculous uh, uh, regimens that we're uh, implementing. And I'll stop here for uh, questions or comments. <laughs>